something like you. How many of you know somebody who says they don't believe? Something like you. That's the person that Jesus got. I mean, not only did Jesus get that person, but that person actually liked Jesus, wanted to be around Jesus, wanted to hear what he had to say, would bypass all religious groups and all the religious talk, but they would show up in crowds to hear what Jesus had to say and see what he was doing. And not only that group, but even all of the people who spent life safely within the walls of religion, they wanted to come and see too. He says, this is Jesus. Not something improved, but something new. Not a way back, but a way forward. Not more religion, but the gospel. Not just for one group, this is for the world. This is for the nations. This is for all people. It's where hate and violence and lust don't control us. This is gonna change you. This is gonna bring heaven here. This is gonna be what we need. And this is what Jesus says. And Matthew invites you to come and see that this is Jesus. All right, how we doing at 1140? Come on, so glad to see all of you. And those of you that are watching online, this is so cool to be here. Thank you for making it out here in the snow. You are the real troopers, the real troopers, and you made it. Glad you're here safely, and hopefully you're having some fun with family and in the snow and staying safe and warm and dry. I, guess, uh, I went outside this morning, and I was trying to clean off my windshield of my car, and I didn't know it was that thick, so I had a little broom, and I put it on the windshield, and the broom disappeared. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna be here a while. So cool to be here, and I'm excited about this series. This is Jesus, and we've been in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's been so exciting for me and for us to kind of revisit our theology, revisit our Christology, revisit all of these ologies that shape who we are as human beings. But not only that, it shapes how we see the world and how we follow Jesus in the context of who we are. And so we've been in this series, and Matthew's helping us see that every Everything that points towards hope and healing and restoration and transformation is Jesus. And I don't know what you brought in here today. I don't know what cares of life that you walked in here with today. But it's my prayer that as we leave, you would see those cares and those concerns through the lens of Jesus and know that there is hope, know that there is light, and know that there is another chance. Last week, we started out with the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' best sermon ever, the manifesto where Jesus gives us these teachings that are the most quoted throughout Christendom. And we started in chapter 5 with the Beatitudes. These divine blessings that show us how to live. Not only that, Jesus gives us insight on our relationships and how to manage that. But not only that, he shows us what true generosity looks like. And as a church, we say you don't give to the church, you give through the church. And it's through your generosity we're able to have life transformation in our city. Then at the tail end of chapter 5, Jesus shows us what it looks like to love our enemies. Love our enemies. I don't know about you, but I skipped that section. Anybody else skip that section? <laughs> Loving our enemies. That can be very difficult to love our enemies, and we can only do that if we follow Jesus and his leading in our lives. And today, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, and I'm excited about Matthew chapter 6 because we see chapter 5. Jesus is going to take even a deeper dive in chapter 6 and peel back the layers of the onion on what it looks like for you and I to get to the core of being on this mission with Jesus. He helps us see what it looks like looks like from a place of spiritual authenticity for you and I to follow Jesus with who we really are. And so what is Jesus up to in chapter 6 of Matthew as we take this deep dive? He's up to this. For those of you taking notes, Jesus provides spiritual practices that protect your soul. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look at three parts. Jesus provides spiritual practices that protect our soul. This word soul, a loaded word, a lot of subjectivity to it. And I can probably interview many of you and you would have a different notion of what this word soul means. For some of you, it's James Brown, Aretha Franklin, and Motown as we think through soul. And everybody under 40 is like, who is James Brown and Aretha Franklin? <laughs> See me in the lobby. I'm just, I'm showing you my age. What is your soul? Matter of fact, how is your soul? How are you doing really on the inside? Doug Fields, author of the book Refuel, he says this about your soul. Powerful quote. He says, your soul is the invisible, eternal part of you, the part that connects with God. He says, your soul is the real you. 
Who are you? Who's the real you when nobody's around, when you're all by yourself? Who is it that shows up? Who is it that's on the inside? Many times in our lives, we, we have this outside part of us, but with that, we have the temptation to mask who we are. And Jesus is going to help us see this morning how we take off that mask. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, as we dive into part 2 of this Sermon on the Mount, he says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. He says, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, Jesus says, they have received their reward in full. Jesus brings out a key word that we're going to unpack here for a minute, and perhaps you've heard it before, this word hypocrite. <coughs> hypocrite. Anybody ever heard of the word hypocrite before? Anybody ever call anyone a hypocrite? Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> I think at some level, all of us have a, an awareness or a notion of what hypocrite means. And I looked it up for the textbook definition of hypocrite, and it's profound. A hypocrite is simply this. It's an actor or actress or a stage player. An actor, an actress, a stage player. Somebody who puts on a character. Somebody who's acting, somebody who is portraying something that's different than on the inside. Maybe you say it like this. A hypocrite is somebody who practices one thing but preaches another. A hypocrite is somebody who has this facade on the outside, but on the inside, there are things going on. Ran across this quote from Paul Franklin Watson, who was a Canadian-American marine wildlife conservation and environmental activist. Say that five times. He said this about this notion of hypocrite or hypocrisy. He said, everybody is a hypocrite. You can't live on this planet without being a hypocrite. And I know there is tension in that quote, and I'm sure it's open for healthy debate. And for the sake of argument, let's say that everybody on the planet is not gripped with hypocritical ways. But I would offer this this morning. Maybe you, maybe I, perhaps are tempted sometimes to have hypocritical ways. Let me ask you this way. Have you ever been tempted to wear a mask? Have you ever been tempted to hide what's really going on on the inside? Have you ever been tempted to, to expose the gap between our motives and our actions, our public life and our private life? If we have on this mask, we'll be doing our good deeds for the wrong reasons so we can get the credit and get the personal accolades. In your notes, it says good deeds are intended to announce the kingdom of heaven, not to gain the admiration of others. Our good deeds that we do as followers of Jesus are to announce the kingdom of heaven, to announce that there is a new sheriff in town, to announce that there is a new regime, a new way of doing business, and his name is Jesus. And I get it. I'm an only child. Are there only children in the room? Only children. There we go. Hey, let's unite. Only child small group right after this gathering. Let's unite and support one another. I love attention and I love personal accolades. So I have to be careful that I don't do my good deeds in church so I can get all the credit. No, I don't get all the credit. Jesus gets the credit. Ken is not the hero. Jesus is the hero. He's the one that has the cape. And as a church, we're committed to loving our city. We say that good deeds lead to goodwill, which leads to the sharing of the good news, which leads to gospel transformation. We say that we love Silverdale. We love Bremerton. We love Port Orchard. We love Paulsboro. We love Squim. We love Belfair, North Mason, and the list goes on and on and on. But those good deeds are to announce that Jesus can change lives, not so that Ken can get a pat on the back. And Jesus helps us get to the core of why we do what we do. He helps us get to the core of what it looks like in protecting our souls as we are on this mission. He even does it with spiritual practices. Let's pick it up at verse 5. Not only does he talk about good deeds, he takes a step even further with our personal spiritual practices. He says in verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. There are those words again. Don't be like an actor or an actress or a stage player who loves to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, this is all the reward they will ever get. 
Then Jesus equips us on what this looks like. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. There's an open reward. And Jesus is not suggesting that we don't have corporate prayer and have prayer moments. But he's saying when you pray, you do it from a place of authenticity. And if you are tempted to pray so people can see you, he's saying you need to go off by yourself, shut the door so Jesus can see the real you. What does this private prayer life look like for you today? Prayer, this conversation with God, this act of meditation, this act of worship. I don't know what your prayer life looks like. It looks many different ways. You can pray how God is leading you and how you are wired to pray and what that looks like. That's between you and Jesus. But I love what Charles Spurgeon says about prayer. He says this, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It's far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. A spiritual transaction. Think about that. A spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. When you and I have this moment where we spend time in prayer, spend time in meditation and fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is taking something that you think you have to have, like a cup of coffee, and saying, you know what? I'm going to take a break from that cup of coffee. I'm going to take a break from this food, whatever it might be, and refocus that energy to God and trust that as I refocus, I'm going to get new insight to move forward on this mission. And I know fasting is hard. One of the things that I struggle from fasting from is Krispy Kreme donuts. Anybody else? Krispy Kreme? <laughs> That's the hardest thing, especially when my wife says, hey, let's go shopping in Tacoma. No, I'm fasting. I don't want to turn over in the Krispy Kreme store. Protect my soul. <laughs> it's hard. I get it. But when we direct our attention, there's a shift. These spiritual practices of prayer and fasting are designed to shift your attention away from yourself and toward God. Every time that the attention is shifted on Ken, here's what happens. I wear a mask because people can't see the real me because if you saw the real me, perhaps you wouldn't want to be in community with me. If you saw the real me, perhaps you wouldn't be in fellowship with me or want to even talk to me. But if, when I shift my attention on to God, you don't see Ken, you see God working through me and he gets the glory. Maybe this week you need to shift your attention, remove some distractions. And what's the reward of that? We're not just doing this for nothing. The reward for spiritual practices is a rich relationship with God. A rich relationship with God. Do you know that God requires, God honors a rich relationship with you? Do you know that God wants an up and close and personal intimate relationship with you? That is why Jesus came. And Matthew helps us see. That's why Jesus is here, because of sin and evil. That relationship was severed. And God says, no, I love my creation so much that I'm going to do something about that to bridge that gap. And Jesus comes. And when you and I say yes to Jesus, we are, that relationship is mended. And Jesus sends his Holy Spirit so we can be on that mission with him to help heal this world. And yes, there is an enemy trying to feed our, our hearts and our minds with all these lies to stop us from reaching our fullest potential. I want you to hear today that Jesus is here so you and I can have a relationship with the Father. Don't let anything try to take that away from you. He desires a relationship. And with that relationship, here's the good news. We don't have to wear a mask because he knows who we are deeply. And so Jesus shows us what it looks like as we do deeds in the community from a place of authenticity. Shows us what it's looked like when we practice our spiritual prayer to do it from a place of authenticity. But with that, if you're saying, hey, I still can't connect the dots, he takes it even a step further. Jesus teaches his prayer to help you go on the mission with him. Jesus teaches his prayer to help you go on the mission with him. We do not have to leave here empty-handed today. We do not have to leave here unequipped today. There is a prayer that Jesus shows us that can help us be on this mission. It can be said that all the teachings of Jesus are found in the Sermon on the Mount. And all the Sermon on the Mount is found in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. How many of you have heard of the Lord's Prayer before or seen it written? Maybe even know it by heart. Yeah, this Lord's Prayer, the model prayer that has all the components necessary for you and I to go on the mission with Jesus. Many different translations of this prayer. We're going to read it together in the NLT, New Living Translation. And it says this, pray like this. 
I love that. Let's park there for a second. Notice Jesus doesn't say, if you pray like this. Even in the previous verse, he said, when you pray. Jesus is saying, prayer is a spiritual practice that you and I need in order to be on the mission. It's not an option. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food that we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And do not let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus provides this pattern for you and I for prayer. And maybe you're here and this is your first time in church. This is an excellent prayer to lean into, to help you get handles, to help you get framework on what it looks like to have this spiritual transaction with the creator in heaven and earth and to give you momentum as you move on this mission. As it was common for rabbis, Jesus teaches his disciples an actionable daily prayer to remind them and to remind us today of his mission. What is his mission? New life, people becoming the church on the mission with Jesus to do what? Help heal the world. What is this mission that we are on? We are on this mission to help heal the world with Jesus. So not only does God desire a relationship with you, he has a plan and a purpose for you to help with this reconciliation process. There is something that God's putting on your heart individually and collectively that is going to send you, that's going to equip you to help heal the world. Freedom February, many of you have leaned in on this help heal the world process. When you are in a place of authenticity, you have a mission that says, I'm going to help heal the world. Why? Because I'm free. Praying, praying this prayer refocuses your life on God, his kingdom, his will, his provision, forgiveness, and his protection. Praying this prayer refocuses your, your attention on what God's will is, what, what forgiveness looks like. And maybe you're here and your attention is all over the place. This prayer is a prayer that can center who you really are. This prayer is a prayer that can get us refocused. And I was wondering as I'm looking at this prayer, how would Ken's trajectory change if I prayed this prayer every day? If I pray this prayer three times a week, and I'm believing this across all our locations, many campuses are represented here today. Thank you for being here. I'm believing a thousand people are going to memorize the Lord's Prayer throughout this series and report back on the impact that it's having on your life as you are going on the mission with Jesus. We need something to keep us focused. We need something to keep us grounded. Why is that important? Because of worry. The cares of life can cause us to worry, and we need to have an anchoring foundation. Matter of fact, Jesus kind of concludes chapter 6 by providing freedom from your worry. Jesus provides freedom from your worry. What is worry? Worry is to allow one's minds to dwell on difficult troubles. Anybody's mind ever dealt on a difficult trouble before? Have you ever found yourself worried? Maybe it's a test result from the doctor, the status of a relationship. Maybe you're wondering your next career move. Many employees, I was talking to the lobby after the 9 o'clock, uh, 10, 20 gathering. There are people that are still worried about their job, asking for prayer in this season as the bills are adding up and they don't have the money to match. Maybe you're here and you're worried about, hey, I have all the things that I need. I have all the money in the bank. I have the car. I have the house. I have the job. But there is something still missing. I feel empty. I'm not qu quite clear what my next step is. We all worry. And maybe you're like me, you're worrying about the Lakers. Even though they have LeBron James, we still might not make the playoffs. <laughs> worry. The enemy likes to use worry to stop us from being on this mission. Corey Ten Bloom, a Dutch watchmaker and writer who helped during the, the, the Nazi regime help Jews hide in her home to escape persecution. She said this about worry. She said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. Sorrow is going to still be there. Tomorrow is still going to be there. But what worry does is it allows us to get all of the strength zapped out of us to keep the momentum for the next day. I was talking in the lobby and somebody said, worry is paying interest on something that we God never intended us to buy. 
And I've been there in situations and cares of life and all the responsibilities, and maybe you're here, and you are the single point of contact in your family, the single point of contact on your job, the single point of contact in the community, and everybody's looking to you for answers, and you're saying, hey, I don't have all the answers, and it can be overwhelming. Maybe today is the day you say, you know what? I'm going to get re-centered on Jesus and allow him to work through me and give all my cares and worry to him. Because at the end of the day, if we're not careful, as Jesus shows us, worry can be another master. That's why he says in verse 24, let's look at it. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. What is Jesus saying? He's contrasting kind of this earthly, earthly values with kingdom or eternal values. He's doing a compare and contrast to let us know that our loyalty, first and foremost, needs to be in things that are eternal, things that won't fade, things that won't be used up, things that won't fade away and die. Where's your loyalty at today? Where's your loyalty? Because when our loyalty is divided between two different masters, we are unstable in everything that we do. The scripture says an unstable, somebody who is double-minded is unstable in all of their ways. Maybe today's a day you're going to pick a side instead of being right or left, up or down, hot or cold, to or fro. Maybe today's a day you say, you know what, I'm going to just follow one master and that's Jesus. Because when we are divided and our loyalty is divided, we begin to worry. That's why Jesus says in verse 25, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more important than food and your body more important than clothing? Look at the birds. They do not plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Wow. Wow. And of course, Jesus is suggesting that we, we have food and we have drink and certainly that we wear clothes. He's not suggesting that. But what he's saying is don't allow these things to consume you. Don't allow these things to occupy who you are because when you're occupied by worry, what do you do? You can put on a mask that stops you from being who you've been called to be. And I get it. I understand it. Sometimes for the planners in the room, we have to have the spreadsheet and we have to be a good steward of the time ahead. Jesus is not suggesting that we be not be, uh, not, don't worry about the future or plan for retirement or have all these things ahead. What he's suggesting is following him allows you to stay in the moment and then trust him for the future that he'll provide. In my home, I take out the trash on Thursday morning. And my love language is acts of service. And so by taking out the trash every Thursday, it's a way that I let my wife know I love her very much. Anybody else, man, let's take out the trash. That's how our wife knows that we love her, right? My wife's like, you can find another way to show your love to me than taking out the trash. <laughs> Especially when she doesn't even acknowledge it. You know, it's at the side, this isn't in the notes. Ladies, when we take out the trash, will you just acknowledge it, please? Sorry, I had to, I had to get that out. I had to get that out. <laughs> Take out the trash, and sometimes we see the birds. I have a big tree on the other side of my neighborhood where there's a whole bunch of birds that live in the nest, and they'll come down to all the trashes in our neighborhood, especially if the container's not closed all the way, and they'll pick at the trash. Birds pick at the trash, and for me, I'm just kind of watching this phenomenon. I get irritated because typically if they don't find what they're looking for, all the trash is in front of my driveway. My neighbors as well. Sometimes, I don't know how they do it, the whole bag will be out of the trash. <laughs> some strong birds. But then I thought about that for this moment as I see these birds digging through the trash and thinking about how Jesus says, aren't you more valuable than the birds and how I provide for them than the things that I throw away, the things that I think are trash, that are garbage. God says, I use that very thing to provide. And there are things in your life you're trying to say, God, how is this going to work? God, how are these dots going to connect? How am I going to make it to this next step? And God is saying, will you just trust me? If I can use trash to feed the birds, I can certainly have provision to make sure you have everything you need. Amen. Are we in a position where we trust him today? And I struggle with the trash because I come from California. And when I was in California, you can recycle stuff. A bottle is 10 cents and a, and a can is 5 cents. And so I come to Washington State and they're throwing that in the trash. I'm like, wait a minute, that's money. <laughs> Not only does God provide for the birds, but he provides for us too. Why are you sending that to waste management? That's cash in the bank. <laughs> 
What is it that you think perhaps is thrown away? That marriage, that relationship, that career move, that, that forgiveness, and you think, you know what, it's trash, and God's saying, no, I'm using that to provide, and I'm going to use that to build bridges so you can be all that you've called to be. Yeah. Worry. I'm believing today somebody's going to get set free from worry today. Why? Because worry does some things, and Jesus understood how worry can affect us. Number one, it affects your productivity. When you and I worry, we're not as productive as God has called us to be because we're so consumed with stuff we can't control anyway. Not only that, it can affect your health. When I'm worrying, I get a pit in my stomach that I cannot explain, and it's unhealthy. Many of you know when you're worried, there are things that happen to you physically, high blood pressure, fill in the blank. It can also negatively affect how you treat other people. I don't know about you, but when I'm preoccupied with worry and the cares of this life, I'm not the best husband. I'm not the best father. I'm not the best friend I should be. Why? Because I'm not present. I'm thinking about things that I can't even control. What are you thinking about today? Because worry can also distort your view of, of, it can distort your view of Jesus. It can block you from the promises that Jesus has when you and I worry. It can block you from the promises that are found in the Bible that we can stand on and have a sure foundation. Promises that allow our souls to be protected. Promises that allow us to take off the mask. Promises that say we can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives us the strength. Promises that say greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Promises that say we can do all things and through Christ who gives us strength and that all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose, promises that say if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, promises that say I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Is there anybody in here that wants to stand on God's promises? Come on. Like I told the 1020 gathering, I'm not going to call you out here in the snow and play games with you. We need to be set free. Maybe today's the day you're going to stand on a promise that says no matter what I'm going through, I'm going to be anchored in what Jesus says and no longer be a slave to fear and be a child of God. Because what dominates your thinking, as it says your notes, will become your master. And disciples and followers of Jesus are free to focus on God's kingdom over life's worries. What if today's a day you took a principle from this sermon, a principle from Jesus' Sermon on the Mountain, and said, I'm going to replace that with the worry and watch how it changes the trajectory of my life. That's why Jesus says, Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and he will give you everything that you need. Put first things first. When Ken's priorities are aligned and Ken understands who is first and who is center stage, there is this trust, this faith that comes that says, Jesus will give me everything that I need. It might not look like it. It might not feel like it. All the, all the odds might be stacked against me, but I love following Jesus. Why? Because odds don't matter to Jesus. The odds of him on the cross not having the victory seemed like we had lost, but when he rose from the dead. He let the whole world know through the power of the resurrection, you don't have to worry anymore. I've conquered sin and the grave, and I can conquer whatever it is you're worried about. Martin Luther says it this way. Pray and let God worry. God's like, I'm big enough. I can handle this. Why don't you just give it to me? I'll take care of that. Don't allow that thing to immobilize you. And here's the difference. You know, Here's how you know if you're walking in worry or a genuine concern. Because I get the tension. There are things that are on our minds. But here's how you know the difference. Worry will immobilize you. Genuine concern will move you to action. And maybe there are some things you're worrying about. And maybe the shift may not be all the way to just forget about it. Maybe the shift is to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take this thing from worry, shift it to a genuine concern, and then take action. And allow Jesus to make a way. God had a genuine concern for you and I as he saw this gap between him and his creation through sin. And he was so concerned about it that he sent his son Jesus to die so you and I can have the way back to him. And when we do that, we can trust as seeking God and his kingdom each day will lead you to trust that God knows and meets all of your needs. As the band comes and we prepare to pray together, I have a question that I want to ask you. That if the forecast keeps up and there is snow, you're going to have nothing else to do this week. You can reflect on this question. <laughs> what is it that's controlling your life? What master 
are you following? Is it worry? Is it doubt? Is it fear? How is your soul? Is your soul protected? Or are you like me sometimes? I want to protect my soul myself. And so to do that, instead of allowing Jesus to, to anchor my soul, I put on a mask. I wear camouflage. And maybe today's the day we take off the camouflage. Unless you're active duty military, we need you in your uniform. And thank you for your service. <laughs> but what if today's the day we take off the mask and be all who God's called you to be? What's controlling your life today? I'm believing all across the Kitsap Peninsula, we're going to have people that say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take off the mask. I don't need to be center stage anymore. I'm going to let Jesus take center stage. Let him be the conductor. Let him be the director. And I'm going to follow him and know that as I follow him, my soul will be protected. I may not have all the answers. I may not have all the money in the bank. I may not have the right relationships. But I guarantee you this, as we follow Jesus and allow him to protect our souls, we have joy. We have peace. We have hope. And we have another chance. I want you to pull out that connection card. A moment where you can respond and then we'll pray together. Maybe you're here today and on the front it says, I'm going to memorize the Lord's Prayer. Will you be one in a thousand? I'm believing for a thousand minimum that say, hey, I'm going to memorize this prayer and report back on the impact that that prayer is having on my life. Maybe you'll say it together as a family. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, hey, you know what? I've been worrying about some stuff and I want to be free. Check that box. We want to pray with you. We want to come alongside you and let you know that you are not alone. Nobody does the mission alone. The enemy wants you to be alone with all that worry and we're going to be a church that says, no, not on our watch. We're going to do this thing together. Walk it out together. Also, some ways you can respond through Rescue Freedom. And on the back. Maybe you're here today, even if, if you're at home, you can just write, take a piece of paper and write something, write a prayer request for the thing that you're worrying about. Take a step of faith today that says, hey, I'm giving this thing to Jesus and I'm going to trust that people are praying with me as I get a true foundation in Christ and I take off the mask. We're going to have a moment to worship together, stay seated and respond, and then we'll pray together as we follow Jesus wherever he leads.